When people think of labor organization in the early 20th century, names like Mother Jones and John L. Lewis come to mind as well-known personalities that shaped labor practices in the U.S. Instrumental in establishing the United Mine Workers Union in Pennsylvania and Illinois, neither could successfully organize the remote mountains of West Virginia where coal operators controlled almost every aspect of miners' lives. That would take a native West Virginian, a man that knew coal mining his whole life, someone who loved West Virginia even more than his own family, and was willing to kill or, if necessary, die to give West Virginians the freedom they deserved, regardless of race. Frank Keeney loved West Virginia. His family moved there after the American Revolution where they cleared the land and farmed nearly 3,000 acres. After the Civil War, a new wave of people came to West Virginia as wildcatters, independent business owners looking to make it rich by coal mining. Capitalists came to West Virginia during the late 19th century where they exploited the people and the resources of mountaineers who did not realize the wealth that was beneath their feet. In 1903, Keeney's life changed forever when he traveled down the road to Paint Creek to listen to a nationally famous union speaker at the United Mine Workers Union rally. There he met the woman he called the most foul-mouthed woman that ever lived. That was the day he met Mary Jones, or Mother Jones as everyone called her. Mother Jones instantly took a liking for the young man and told him to stay out of the pool halls and to go read a book if he really wanted to improve his situation. Keeney watched as mine guards and private detectives hired by mine operators crushed the United Mine Workers' efforts to organize the miners. From 1905 to 1910, he saw the conditions worsen in his southern West Virginia. He saw families evicted from their homes, large tent cities full of half-starved children and constant attacks made by mine guards. A spark ignited in Frank Keeney, and he could not ignore it. It was time for action. In 1912, Keeney moved with his wife and two young children into a Wake Forest Mining Company house. Now he was subject to the company script that could only be spent at company stores. His mail read by mine guards and his home could be searched at any time by mine officials for any reason. Frank Keeney found himself stripped of land and liberty. This treatment hit home with Keeney. He realized that although he wanted his own land, he did not even possess the rights to secure his own property. It was at this time he realized if miners wanted to gain certain basic rights, they would have to make a stand. On April 18, 1912, Paint Creek miners went on strike. The company quickly fired the miners. Keeney was forced to move into the United Mine Workers Tent City at Esdale, along with 7,500 other miners. After three months of living in the tent city, his children were sick with smallpox and his wife was eight months pregnant. Keeney could not sit still any longer. He boarded a train for the District 17 Union Headquarters in Charleston. He asked and then pled with Union leaders to come back to Cabin Creek and finish the job, but they refused. It was too dangerous, they said. Frustrated, Keener replied, I will find someone with nerve enough to go with me, for if you men are afraid to make the trip, there is a woman who will go. Keeney knocked on Mother Jones' door at 1 a.m. with tears in his eyes. He asked if she would go back to Cabin Creek with him and help get something done. She quickly agreed. When Keeney returned to the camp with Mother Jones, the struggle changed completely. She held rallies and made speeches that gave the miners hope. More importantly, she endorsed Frank Keeney as a leader of the miners. The miners would not forget that it was Frank Keeney that brought Mother Jones back to their fight, not the union leadership in Charleston. On August 15, 1912, Governor Glasscock sent the state militia into the Paint and Cabin Creek tent camps. Along the way, they arrested Mother Jones with their spiritual leader in jail, Frank Keeney, and Fred Mooney prepared the miners for war. Keeney organized the men into groups and gave them specific instructions to carry out. Keeney and his minor turned soldiers carried out their missions against the mine guards, not the state militia or citizens. In April 1913, a train passed the Holly Grove tent colony and sprayed the camp with automatic machine gun fire. 
killing several and wounding many others. In retaliation, Keeney blew the railroad tracks that passed by any of the tent camps. A month later, the mine operators agreed to meet in neutral territory with Union leaders. As a result, the Hatfield contract named after the recently elected governor that encouraged a settlement was signed. It granted miners a nine-hour workday and a two-and-a-half cent raise. Keeney saw this as a very small victory, since the miners worked by the ton, not the hour. By the end of July, coal operators were forced to quit using the mine guard system due to an investigation from the federal government made aware of the situation because of the extreme nature of conflict in West Virginia. Mine owners gave in to the miners' demands. Keeney had led the miners to their first real victory in the coal fields of southern West Virginia. Tempers flared again in 1919 in Mingo and Logan counties when the Marshal of Maitwan and friend of Keeney's, Sid Hatfield, was involved in a gunfight between Baldwin Feltz agents that left 10 people dead. While on his way to court for the trial, Hatfield, along with a friend, were gunned down in broad daylight. No one was charged in the killings, infuriating Keeney. On August 7, 5,000 miners met at the state capitol in Charleston. Mother Jones and Frank Keeney spoke to the inflamed crowd. Keeney's speech summarized the mood of the miners. You have no recourse except to fight. The only way you can get your rights is with a high-powered rifle. In neighboring Logan County, Sheriff Don Chafin let it be known that any Union member that showed up in Logan County would be shot. Keeney issued his own reply. If our organizers come back in pine boxes, neither heaven nor hell will be able to control the miners. Organize Logan County we will, and no one shall stop us. Several days of fighting followed in which many of both sides were killed. Numbers vary between as low as 30 up to as high as 100. Keeney, along with several other Union leaders, were arrested and later charged with a host of charges, all of which Keeney was found not guilty of. By 1924, Keeney believed that his union had become like his state, owned and operated by outsiders. He decided to form a new union led by West Virginia men, but he believed that miners needed more than a union. They needed a political party to change the political landscape of the state, so he formed the West Virginia Labor Party in 1931. President Franklin D. Roosevelt was well aware of the struggles that occurred in West Virginia and knew that something had to be done before more people were killed and other such strikes break out in other parts of the country. In 1933, he passed the National Industrial Recovery Act, which allowed miners to organize anywhere in any state. Keeney paid a high price to fight the mine operators in West Virginia. He lost his home, most of his belongings, and had very little money. His wife, Bessie, tired after years of being second to his miners' union for attention, left her husband and moved to Arizona with their son. On May 22, 1970, Frank Keeney died and was buried in Belle, Virginia at the age of 88. Dozens of miners showed up to his funeral. One miner approached C.B. Keeney, Frank's grandson. After offering his condolences, he told the young Keeney that his grandfather was a good man. Keeney's grandson said, You must have thought a lot of him. The old miner smiled and said, Son, we killed for that man. To us, he stood taller than that mountain over there. Coal fields back in 1921. The National Guard, state police, and the coal company guns shot down a hundred miners. The bosses saw his bombs, and up on Old Blair Mountain, the ghost of feeling strong. 